Hey, what's up? So this is the effect we're gonna create in this tutorial. We have this swirly looking thing that follows a curve. Here's a quick render made with this technique. And we'll be making use of the fact that we can now have the geometry nodes modifiers work together with other modifiers in the stack, which wasn't really possible to do like this before. I will go through every step of the process, but I won't explain every detail, so this is not a complete beginner tutorial. But I have put some short explanatory text boxes in the video that you can pause and read through if you want to know more about a certain thing. This format is also a bit of a test, so do let me know what you think about it. But without any further ado, let's get into the tutorial. Okay, so first of all, as always, you need to go to the builder.blender.org website and download this latest 2.93 alpha build to have all the features that I'm using in this video. And once you have that opened up, we can start working on the effect. Let's first delete the cube and add a plane to distribute some points on. Let's add a geometry notch modifier from here. And then we'll go to the geometry nodes editor. We will add a point distribute node and increase the density a bit. Since we don't want any points to be really close to each other, we will change this from random to poison disk mode so that we can control the minimum distance that the points need to be from each other. And now we'll add a curve object that we can then use to guide the swirly effect. You can make any kind of a shape you want for the curve. I'll just make this simple turn here. Make sure to make the curve long enough so that the swirls have some distance to travel. And also increase the curve resolution to make the effect smoother. Now we need to select the plane again. And since these preview dots are not selectable, we can just do it here in the outliner. Let's now add a screw modifier in here. Adding another modifier like this will convert the distributed points to vertices that this next modifier can then use. The screw modifier takes the geometry, the converted vertices, and extrudes it in steps and spins it around a selected axis, which is Z by default. We can increase this screw value here to make it also bring the geometry up every step, and we'll set it to 20 for this effect. We'll also increase this angle to make it spin more, and we'll set the viewport step amount to 500 and the render step amount to 1000. If you start having performance issues later on, you can try decreasing these values to make it a bit lighter. After the screw modifier, we can add a curve modifier. We can collapse this, and for the curve modifier, select the curve we just made. We'll set the deform axis to Z, and now the swirls follow the curve nicely. You can tweak the curve anytime to adjust the effect. And now we will add another geometry nodes modifier. And it made a new different node group for us, which you can see here. And to this node group we will add a point instance node, which will put an object instance at the place of every vertex in the geometry. You see that we need to specify an object for it, so we'll quickly add a UV sphere to the scene and make it pretty small. And let's select the plane again from here and choose the sphere we just made for the point instance node. Now we have a nice looking swirly effect. And next we need to control the scale of the instances so that we get that nice moving lines effect. To do that we'll add yet another geometry nodes modifier to the stack. And this time it'll go after the screw modifier and before the curve modifier. The order of the modifiers is really important, so make sure to have it match what you see here. We will disable the curve modifier for a bit, just to make it easier to understand the calculations that happen here before the geometry is curved by this next modifier. At this point it's good to name these geometry node modifiers to make it less confusing. So this first one will be distributing points, the last one will be instancing points, and this new middle one will be scale controller. We'll then add an empty sphere to the scene, and we'll also call that scale controller. The idea is to compare these instances Z location to the Z location of this controller object, and that way write down a custom scale attribute for these instances. 
So let's select this middle geometry nodes modifier here and we'll first get this empty object's location to this node graph here by adding an object info node. We'll select the scale controller from here and then we'll add a separate XYZ node because we're only interested in the Z location of the controller. Then we'll also add an attribute separate XYZ node for the same reason. We're only interested in the Z location of these instances. You can pause and read the text down there in the corner if you want to know more about attributes. But the short version is that every vertex here has some default attributes before the instancing, like position and rotation, which are just values with different data types like vectors and floats and so on. Every vertex's attribute values can be unique, so a vertex down here will have a different position attribute value than a vertex up here. So these attribute nodes are just a handy way of doing different operations on all of these thousands of vertices attributes that we have in this geometry. So with this attribute separate node, we're going to look at the position attribute, which is a vector. And we separate the x, y and z values into three new float attributes here. And we will call those simply x, y and z. Then we add an attribute math node and we subtract the Z location of the vertices from the Z location of the empty object. And we write the result down in a new attribute called Z underscore dist for distance. We can then add an attribute color ramp node, which we'll use to remap the Z distance attribute and to also clamp the values between zero and one. We'll come back to this color ramp later. Then we'll add an attribute mix node and we will mix the scale attribute, which is a reserved name, and will automatically map to the scale of the instance object with the zdist attribute with a factor of one. So we take the scale attribute and we completely override its values with the values from this zdist attribute. And then we'll write the result of this operation back on top of the scale attribute. So essentially we are just remapping the zdist attribute to the scale attribute. So now you can see that when we move this controller up and down, the instances scale up from 0 to 1 according to the z location of the controller. Let's select this again and we can now tweak this color ramp here to remap the 0 to 1 progression to something like this where the instances will also disappear. The trails are now a bit too short, so we can just add an attribute math node before the color ramp and divide this zdist attribute with a value of like 5 and write the result back to the zdist to make the fall off a bit longer like this. I'd also like to randomize each of the strands so that they don't all appear and fade out at the same time. And to do that we need a random attribute that's different for each of these strands here, but not different for every vertex in a given strand. So the logical place to do it is in the first geometry nodes modifier, where we only distributed the initial points to this plane here. So we'll add here an attribute randomized node after this point distribute node here. We will call this rand1 and it'll have values ranging from 0 to 1. And since we'll need another one in a moment, we will also make a rand2 attribute, which will have values from 0 to 2. And also we'll make sure to have a different seed for these two randomized nodes. So since we do all of these extrusions and this other stuff after this initial point distribution, those random values that we generated here will carry over to these extruded strands here. Going back to the middle geometry nodes modifier here, we can now just add an attribute math node here after this attribute separate node. And we now have access to the rand1 and rand2 attributes here, so we can just take the z attribute and add to it this rand2 attribute and write it back to the z attribute. 
And that way this attribute math node here that's comparing the controller Z location to these vertices now thinks that the vertices on these different strands have a little bit differing Z location values, which results in this nice random offset effect. They all appear and disappear at a bit different heights, which looks very nice. So now we have this really nice swirly effect. And what we can now do is we can go back to the modifiers and enable this curve modifier again. And since we are making the curving after the Z location calculations, the fall off effect will actually still work just fine. It's just now going along the curve, just like we want it. And the curve is still freely editable, since this whole effect is completely procedural. And to add a nice additional touch to this effect, we will maybe make this sphere just a bit bigger, like this, and go to the middle geometry nodes modifier again, and add one more attribute math node after everything else. And this will be a multiplying operation. We will multiply the scale value with the rand1 attribute that we created earlier and write that back to the scale attribute. And what that does is it makes these strands have a random thickness to them. It might be nice to never have a thickness of zero, so we will increase this minimum value of the rand1 attribute to something like 0.4. And now the effect is done, and it looks really nice. I hope you found the tutorial useful. And instead of the usual thought tinkering at the end of the video, I decided to do something a little bit different this time. Okay, how about a short round of disc golf in the dark and snowy Finland with these glow-in-the-dark discs and a very good camera for low-light shooting. Sounds like fun to me, except that I'm not a very good thrower yet, so don't expect too much, uh, especially in these conditions here. But we'll see what we can do. I lit up the basket there so you can see where I'm aiming. Let's take out the compass and have some light. And we'll see. I went too right, but we still should be able to get a par at least from down there. A lot of snow in here. I have a long look, but I'm really not expecting to make this. Well, a little short. But that's a tap in. There we go, the first hole. Oh nice, and we have a truck coming. You can see from the headlights how incredible this camera is in the dark. It's the Sony A7S III, for those of you who are wondering. So here I'm also gonna go just straight at it. Try to get through that little gap on the right side of the basket and then fade in. Oh no, to right again. I need to fix that. We have this really nice winter course here in Pikkarla, Oulu. They made these really nice walkable tracks here. And we have shorter tee positions and everything. So really disc golf is a year-round sport in Finland. At least on these better courses. I actually kind of still have a putt here. Oh no, too short. <sighs> Again. Par. I think I'll play the first nine holes today and see what kind of a score we can get in the dark. So this is a bit longer than the previous two. You can see the basket there. It's a long right to left curve and it sort of straightens out at the end. So I'm trying to throw a high Anheuser and let it float down there. I think I hit something and it dropped down to the middle. I got a bit lucky there. I went through that little gap. I was aiming to go here at the big fairway. Still quite a long way to the basket. I think I'm actually gonna go Anheuser again. I feel like there's more space with the Anheuser curve. Go, go, go. Not bad. 
think that's okay. Don't leave it short now, Alexi. <laughs> it wasn't short. Over the top. So that'll be the bogey, the first bogey for us. A bit of an overcorrection. So this is a completely straight shot down that tunnel. So let's see if I can correct the right leaning throws. That's better. Oh, that was actually not that bad. Kind of scraped some branches there, but didn't seem to stop all the way. Oh, just passed. So we are one over. Okay, you can see the basket down there. It's a downhill shot, so I'm actually going to go with a putter and try to throw the hyzer over the trees on the right side. Let's go! Come back! Yes! Should be money. It seems to be really close. Let's see if we can get the first birdie. It's pretty close. Man, look at the stars. It's so pretty out here. Okay, let's not miss this one. It's really close. Yes! The first birdie and back to even. Nice! It looks like my microphone battery is dying, so... I might have to end this round prematurely, but we'll see. So this will go with the compass again. It's slightly downhill again. There's actually a route both on the left and the right side. You guys probably can't tell from the video, but I'm going for the right side. Almost straight, a little bit of hyzer. I did not see where that landed. <laughs> Hopefully we can find it. It felt like a good shot out of the hand, but let's go have a look. That's not bad outside of the circle, but definitely not bad for this hole. Looks like I have a branch on my way. I have to go Anheuser and quite low, so it's not really an easy putt by any means. Oh, wow! We got it! That was nice! So we are minus one now. Did not expect to make that one. Nice. Baskets there. This is an uphill shot. We'll go with the compass. I think I actually might try to go just straight at it. And the mic battery died here. This is me from the future. I was talking here about how I often see a game of disc golf also as a, a sort of a mindfulness exercise especially when you are playing with friends and have a competition going on. It's usually a great way to drive up some emotions and to get to practice handling those emotions and staying calm and positive. And even when playing by myself, just keeping in mind that I'm out there having fun first and foremost and to not get upset about bad shots or anything like that. When I'm out there at the courses, I see a lot of swearing and anger and I'm like, doesn't seem very fun to always be angry and always be swearing at your shots when they don't go exactly where you wanted them to go. You know, looking from the outside, it seems very silly to get so upset about a bad throw or an unlucky break. But having started playing more last year myself, I've learned that it really does try to get to you a lot of the time. Even in this round, I think I had a few putts or throws where I immediately after the throw exclaimed something negative about the throw. It's really hard to not do that and to just be like, okay, that did not go where I wanted it to go. But yeah, that's why I see it as a great way to practice handling emotions and practice uh, staying positive. It's an interesting, more physical way of getting that sort of practice compared to things like meditation, for example. 
Okay guys, so my external microphone died and it's getting quite late, so I think I'm gonna end this here. I think we played seven holes and the end result was one down, which is actually better than I was expecting. I was thinking if we could stay even here, I'd be pretty happy. So one down is definitely good for me in these uh, challenging conditions. I hope you had fun watching, I had a lot of fun throwing. But that's it for now, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you later.